Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu alel meb'uthi rahmeten lil alemin. Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve baraka ve selleme teslimen kathiran ila yevmiddin amma ba'd. Human beings, us, the human race, the Adamic race, we are social beings. We generally exist with one another, we live with one another, and we need one another. It's very difficult for humans to exist in isolation. It's very difficult for human beings to assume that they will do everything that they need for their daily lives, everything from producing their food to their building material and to everything else alone. Some people, they do the building material. Some people, they produce the food. Some people take care of other aspects. So that's why we coexist that way. So we are, in Arabic, this would be called, we are madani in nature. We are social beings that uh, need one another. So if you don't like somebody else, well, it's tough luck because human beings are there to interact with one another. We would not be here if we did not interact with one another. You and I, our existence depends on the fact that our parents came together. If they were loners and did not want to be one another, the human race would not continue. So not just in terms of procreation, but also in terms of getting our needs, whatever we need. You can't produce everything yourself. So that's why we need laws for this. As soon as you have people mixing with one another, there has to be regulations, there has to be limits, there has to be boundaries, there has to be guidance. Because it's inevitable that we're going to have to interact with one another. If there was no guidance of how to interact with one another, how to deal with one another, and obligations regarding one another, then we would, there would be chaos in this world. People would take a debt, uh, a loan from someone else and not pay it back. Say, what are you going to do to me? There was no police force, there was no security, if there was no judge, uh, judgment, judicial system. You can understand, it would just be a massive chaos. There would be massive conflicts, there would be debts. So that's why we need a system that arbitrates all of this, guidance. And that's some part of that needs to be implemented. There's other part of it, we as human beings, most human beings are decent. And they say, okay, we can't do this. Most human beings uh, are not people who will kill, some, kill somebody else, who think it's okay to kill somebody else. There are some people who've deviated and they think it's okay to murder someone else. There's probably a larger group of people who will think it's okay to lie. Right? L more than the people who think that you can kill someone. Right? There's be, there'll be probably, again, a small group of people who think they can just pick up what they see and it's theirs. Even though it's yours, I can just pick it up and take it. So you can see now why these laws are there. So religion provides laws. And then you have systems, political systems, social systems, which provide laws as well. Our own culture has certain laws. This is human. This is just a human reality. That's what we deal with. So one of the very important interactions that we have with one another is in business. Right. We could talk about these interactions on many different levels, but today, and I don't know why I've picked this topic for today, I was, we finished another program and I was just discussing with Ismail, what shall I speak about? I like it when the host community gives me a topic. It's just easy, especially if it's a challenging one, then it's even better. Right? You get to learn something more and research. And when they don't, then I sometimes wonder, what am I going to speak about? So you do a bit of istikhara sometime, you wonder. So I was looking through my notes and I found this topic. Now, I don't know who it's going to be relevant for. I'm hoping it's relevant for all of us. Okay. But in the many different interactions that we have with others, like we could have interactions with our neighbors, with animals, with the environment around us. The, the one that I want to discuss today, which I don't know how often it's discussed or maybe it's useful, is our interpersonal dealings on a transactional level. Uh, they there's a lot of discussion about being kind to one another 
and the social dealings in terms of social etiquette, saying salam, all of this is discussed. But in terms of mu'amalat, in terms of actual monetary dealings, contractual dealings, I don't know if that's discussed as much. So I'm just going to, in the short time that we have, mention a few hadith about this and well, let's, let's try to um, assist ourselves so that we can improve our communities. Because these laws are only good when they're practiced. They're beautiful laws from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But for us, they're only going to work if we practice them. So there's a few things here that I want to mention. There are four aspects here when you do business. What should your intention be in doing business? Yeah, make a lot of profit. Alhamdulillah. Right? That's one thing. So make a lot of profit. Be able to buy a bigger house. Be able to get a bigger masjid. You know, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the same coziness that you find in Clapton Masjid and Stamford Hill Masjid. Um, I don't know what to call you guys, sons of Clapton and Stamford Hill or whatever. But subhanAllah, it feels really it's interesting being here. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. It feels really interesting, right? Maybe you guys came from elsewhere. You didn't come from there, right? No, we live here. You live here? Yes. Oh, so you didn't come from Clapton, Stamford Hill. You're not Hackney guys. No. Okay. Born and raised here. Oh, okay. Most of them. Right. from here anyway. Okay. Number one. And, you know, you're going to make your money. If you're doing business, the purpose of business is to make money. And that's fine, right? You want customers, you want deals, and that's fine. That's part of business. There's nothing wrong with that. But what all we're saying is enrich your business with an Islamic ideal. So when you're doing business, when you're doing work, when you're doing anything to earn money, then have these additional interests, have these additional intentions. So you'll still get, make your money. It will magnify it in the sight of Allah and inshallah you'll have more barakah as well and you'll be rewarded in the very business that you're doing. So the money that you're earning, you may not be rewarded if you don't have any good intention about it except just making money. Now if you have a good intention, inshallah you'll be rewarded for it. So number one, when you do business, you're becoming part of this social enterprise of supplying one another things. Remember, we as human beings need one another to supply us with things because we can't all manufacture bread. So if somebody's supplying bread, alhamdulillah. If so somebody's supplying uh, books, alhamdulillah. You know? So number one, we want to benefit the creation of Allah. Muslims done Muslims. That's one of the intentions in business. I'm providing this service as long as you're not doing a scam business. Right? As long as you're selling something of value and need, then you're benefiting the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one intention. Number two, this is actually more of a governing principle. When you do your business, you will be just. Justice prevails. Justice is a major principle of Islam. So you have to be just in the way you do business. And number three, justice means, for example, um, in some industry, it doesn't happen in all industries. In some cases, you have to give a bribe to just have a fair deal sometimes, right? Um, an official bribe to get the deal, which is wrong. Right? Um, if it's official, that whoever pays this extra money will get the deal, fine. But when it's unofficial, then it's a problem. Number three, in business, one of the most important things to make, uh, to, to shine as a good businessman is trustworthiness. Trust and trustworthiness, truth and trustworthiness. And you'll see the hadith about this. Truth and trustworthiness. And number four, sincerity and open-heartedness. So sometimes people will be in difficulty. So one is you want to make money, but you also want to assist people. You want to give them time if they can't pay. If they can't pay, maybe you want to give them a discount. Maybe you want to, because there has to be an assistance, a compassionate aspect to it. Otherwise, it'll just be pure money, money, money. So, now, let us look at a few guidances in this regard from the Prophet Wasallam. There's a hadith that Imam Bayhaqi has transmitted in his Shu'abul Iman. It's one of the hadith collections from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. This is a very basic idea about this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, طَلَبُ كَسْبِ الْحَلَالِ فَرِيضَةٌ بَعْدَ الْفَرِيضَةِ To earn a lawful living is actually an obligation on you after the primary obligations. The primary obligations, salat, zakat, hajj, fasting, those are your primary obligations. They cannot encroach on that. Your business cannot encroach because your business is an obligation, meaning earning money. It doesn't have to be through business. It could be through working for someone else. That is an obligation. We can't survive if we don't earn a living. We have people who are dependents. 
upon us, dependent upon us. Right? So that's why those who are earning money, they're doing it and understand it to be an obligation from Allah. And on every fard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a reward. So we're fulfilling an obligation, but we have to recognize that we're doing this as a responsibility, not just for the ulterior motive of money, money, money. But that this is uh, my responsibility, I'm fulfilling this responsibility because Allah and the Prophet has said so for my family. Just the change of invent, intention and paradigm and you get reward. So that's the first hadith. What's important here the Prophet وسلم, highlights though is talabu kasbil halal to seek a lawful earning. Which means if the company you're working for, it's not a business but you're working for someone and there's some shady business going on there, or there's some scams going on there, or there's some ha haram component in there, then you avoid it. Then you find another business instead. You find another job instead. At the end of the day, the money we earn to fill our stomach and to nourish our children and to let them grow their bodies. Because when we have children, we have to look after them on several different fronts. One is that we have to nourish them with the right kind of foods. So while we look at healthy foods and we don't give them unhealthy foods, likewise we have to nourish their soul. That's our responsibility as well. Just as the soul, just as the body has to develop from a young infant stage to an adult, the soul has to also develop so that it can be ready to be a good insan in the future when it grows as an adult. So that's why it's important that what we feed them for their body is halal and what we feed them for their soul is halal. Now one is that we could say the ingredients are halal, but we have to see where we're earning it from, where we're getting it from, how we're earning it, whether there's any tainted wealth in there, whether there's any haram element in there. So all of this is actually very, very necessary because it has repercussions. It's not just, okay, it's just going to be pounds in my bank account eventually. However I got it, it's just a bank balance at the end of the day. We can think of it that way. But yes, it's the same pounds, halal gain 10 pound note, and a haram gain 10 pound look will look exactly the same. I don't think it changes. They're not that smart yet. Right? Eventually you might have smart notes. Right? Tainted money is going to look different. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised with the way technology is going. But right now it looks the same. And if it looks the same, then we think, oh, it's all money. You can very easily be deluded and you can forget. But we have to look at this. And may Allah give us the tawfiq because it's very difficult. I, I don't want to sound pessimistic. It's not impossible but it is difficult you know because there's just so much usury and other things out there that it's difficult to have absolutely pure but at least we're paying if if we're trying our best paying our zakat removing that 2.5 percent of dirt from our wealth zakat according to a hadith in sahih muslim is the dirt of the wealth of the believer because we're saying where does this dirt come from i got 100 percent halal wealth like I know all, every penny is halal, lo, lo, uh, is lawfully earned. But the person who gave it to you, again, it's the same 10 pounds. How do you know where it came from? Right? Or do you only deal with absolutely halal people? Where did they get their money from? You know? So 2.5% is what Allah said, give that will help the poor and it will bless the rest of your money. Otherwise, it's like a bacteria which will mess up the rest of your money somehow or the other. You won't enjoy it. Thereafter, our next hadith Imam Ahmed has transmitted from Miqdad, uh, Miqdam ibn Ma'di Karab. He says, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, لا يَأْتِيَنَّ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ لَا يَنْفَعُوا فِيهِ إِلَّا الدِّنَارُ وَالدِّرْهَمُ I've heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that a time will surely come upon the people where, only, where the only thing that will benefit a human being in terms of their social life and so on will be dinars and dirhams. Essentially, you're going to need money. You won't be able to do without money. The bartering system will be gone. Where I, you know, where you have in agricultural areas, like in some villages, you have. I remember in one of the villages I went to, and the barber was called to cut my hair. So I said, "Are you going to pay him?" He said, "No, you don't have to pay him." I said, "Why don't you pay me?" And needs to, you know, survive. But what we do is, they have a system where the, uh, they're all farmers. So when these guys produce his mangoes in there, he'll give him a certain number of mangoes. This guy will give him wheat. This guy will give him rice. This guy will give him corn, and that's how they do it. Of course, they need a bit of money, but nowadays you can't get away without money. It's all about money now, right? So a time will come like that. So money is important. It's just we need to make sure that it's correct, it's halal, it's right. Number three, 
The third hadith is from Imam Tirmidhi, Imam Darami, Imam Daraqutni. They've all related this from Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu an. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, This is one of my really inspirational hadith that really has driven me quite a bit, right? Is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Attajiru saduq al Amin ma'an nabiyin wa siddiqin wa shuhada. The Tajir, the trader, the business person, right? whatever you're doing business in, who is truthful and who is trustworthy, truthful and trustworthy, will be with the prophets and the very, very uh, champions of truth, the Siddiqeen and the martyrs. Now their status is guaranteed, right? They're, these three categories. If you want to join their, stages, uh, their status while enjoying your wealth, and while having money by doing business, then be truthful and be trustworthy. It's a difficult thing, especially when you're really greedy for good business, especially if you're, if you're a savvy business person, then you see business everywhere. You go with somebody who's into property and you don't notice anything. He's like, oh, that's a very good opportunity. That's going to be in an auction. And then this one is like this. And then there's some people, they're going after the Bitcoins right now. They think they're going to get left behind. They might get left behind, but then they might stay safe as well. It's not a fatwa, but I'm just saying, <laughs> right? Um, you have to remember, not every business that may conform to halal principles, right? So in terms of the structure of it, it could be halal and not haram. Doesn't mean it's a good business. You can buy fidget spinners, it's halal. But who's going to now import fidget spinners now from China? That time is gone, right? Yeah. Do you still play with fidget spinners? Anybody? No? Time is gone, right? You may still have a few at home, maybe. Right. But, what is it, five years ago or something, they were bringing in carton, well, uh, crates of it, you know, and they were going. It was, a, it was a craze of the time. It was halal, but it's not a good business anymore. So you have to remember, that there's one thing which is good business and one thing which is halal. This hadith is so inspirational. I'll give you a story. It's helped me in business, right? That let's do business, don't feel shy of doing business. Because doing business is not easy sometimes. There's a certain embarrassment sometimes, depending on what kind of business you're doing, you know, to face people. And in some kinds of business, for example, there was a big scholar of the subcontinent. He's passed away now. His name was Kari Siddiq Bandwi from Eastern UP. A really righteous person, I met him once, a very, very calm, very low-key kind of person. But extremely popular in his areas that the Hindus even loved him, like an amazing individual, but very low-key, very low-key, right? I had the opportunity to meet him once. Now, he wasn't making ends meet. He lived in a little village, so he wasn't making ends meet. So he decided, because he's teaching and so on, so he's deciding, let me do some business. What I'll do is I'll bring in vegetables, sabziyan, as you call it, right? From the city, from the nearby town, and sell it here on one of those laris, mm -hmm. those carts. It's not an easy business to do where you have to stand for the whole day or a few hours and everybody sees you and there's a certain opinion about lari wale, yeah. you know, about cart people and, you know, and so on. It's not the most dignified business, but people make their money with it, right? So he brought that and... He was a shy person by nature anyway. Very low-key, very shy person, very close kind of person. Mm -hmm. And he said, this was one of the toughest things, but what do you do? And he said he was going to give up. But then he remembered this hadith. That I'm doing this tijara, I need to do this tijara. This is not extra income for no reason. This is what I need. Right? So let me do this for this purpose. So the young brothers here that we see here, if you want to start selling... I don't know, pens that somebody might be interested in school, if your school allows it. That would be business. If you have a halal intention, you get rewarded for it. And you can maybe um, get yourself into this category as long as you're trustworthy. So you don't scam anybody. You don't give them faulty goods. You give them um, at what you promised them of the price. You deliver your goods on time. This is what you call trustworthiness. Reason is that when you're a savvy businessman, you see opportunities everywhere and not all of them are absolutely ethical. They may be borderline halal, but they won't always be ethical. That which will probably make them impermissible most likely. But 
there's justification processes that take place. You just justify it's okay, or it's only this, or it's only this percent, or it's only to get me started, something like that. That's why one has to be very, very careful. When you're in business, you will understand that there's just so many opportunities that you will see, and you can't take them all. You have to be careful, even though they're lucrative. And generally, the more unethical ones, they're generally the ones that will make you a bigger buck. It's just the nature of the game because there's risk involved in there and there's some garbage going on, right? So that's why they makes you more money. Now, it's a temptation. It's a major temptation. Now you can understand why the reward of this is so great if you are trustworthy and truthful because it's not easy to resist making a quick buck. It's not easy, especially if you... Once the, 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 the love of money creeps into your heart and it's in your heart, then it's very difficult. That's why this hadith goes to prove something big that if you do stay straight, you're going to have a huge reward. Right? You don't get these rewards for nothing. These are big rewards. Bukhari, again from Miqdad, Miqdam ibn Ma'di Karab, he said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma akala ahadun malan qattu khayran min an yakula min amali yaday. Nobody has consumed, consumed any wealth that is superior and better than that wealth that he's earned by his own hands. Which essentially means the unlawful freebies that are sometimes easily available. You just have to say, make, say a few things. You have to sign a few forms. You have to just conceal a few things. That is not the best of the wealth. What you're going to get from what you earn with your own hands is going to be superior to all of that. What it means by superior is it will go further. And it might be less, but inshallah it will go further. You'll get a bigger bang for your buck. There's more barakah in it, there's more blessing in it. And even in long term, especially if you're feeding our children, there's more barakah in terms of what our children will grow to become with this. Because it's all part of the nourishment of their soul. So while the physical 10 pound note looks the same, if it's corrupted and tainted inside, it will have an effect on the spiritual element of the soul. It will have a spiritual element on the growth of the soul. And this is something serious that we need to consider. May Allah give us the tawfiq to absolutely avoid anything which is unethical. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّ نَبِيَّ اللَّهِ دَاوُدْ the Prophet ﷺ then gave an example of a prophet. Maybe other prophets didn't have to do business, but one prophet we knew who did business. Business in a sense, he provided a service. Dawood ﷺ. His service was that he, uh, pieces of metal had become, Allah had given him a miracle that it would be like um, wax in his hand. So he could just mold it. So he would make coats of armor and other things and he would sell them. So he did business. So business is uh, something that the Prophet Sallallahu himself did as well, right? With Khadija radiallahu anha, he did business as well. So business is a really good act and you can get a lot of barakah in business if you've got the business savvy, right? If you don't have business savvy, it's best to work for somebody else, maybe do some small business just for the sunnah of it, right? But otherwise you may end up losing a lot if you're not business savvy and then you're like, What's, what, what is this? Of course, business is a good thing. You need, there are obviously principles of business. There's a certain insight that people have about business and you can learn about business as well in business schools. Okay, the next hadith is from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, relates it from Rafi ibn Khadij radiallahu anhu. Qila ya Rasulallah. Somebody said, Ya Rasulallah, ayyul kasbi atyab, which is the most excellent form of earning, the most pure form of earning. So the Prophet sallallahu said, amalu rajuli biyadihi, Every earning that a person does with his own hands. So if you work for somebody, you're, you're providing a service, you're doing work with your own hands and you're receiving money, that's the best. And also every uh, trade transaction, which is honest, which is done well. So both the business people are covered in here and the people who work for others and earn their money that way. And the law, uh, there's I think two hadith I'm going to mention and then we're... Um, that should be enough for today to give us an overview of this. The next hadith is also from Imam Ahmad, from Amr ibn al-Asr radiallahu anhu. 
Amr ibn al-As, the famous politician of the people of Makkah. He's the same person who was actually sent by the people of Makkah to Abyssinia to bring back the Muslims when they migrated there. He was an ambassador. He was one of the most intelligent and shrewd men of the Arabian Peninsula. Eventually became Muslim, right? Eventually became Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ once was going to send him. Now he is also became the conqueror of Egypt. That's why that one of the oldest mosques there is the mosque of Amr ibn As in Cairo. He conquered Egypt, right? He's the Fatih of Misr. So once the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, get your armor on and come to me. So he came and he says, now I'm going to send you out at the head of a, an army. I'm going to send, yes, I'm going to send you out at the head of an army. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you safety. Allah will protect you. But I want you to go. Allah will protect you. And the second perk, you're going to stay safe. The second thing is that you're going to get a lot of spoils of war. He then said to him, I have, laka, I have a good hope, a really pious and righteous hope for you for good wealth. Now, Amr ibn Asad maybe didn't understand this properly of why he's doing this and why he's encouraging him, incentivizing him that you're going to make some money out of this as well. He wasn't 100% sure about that, it looks like. So he said, Fakultu Ya Rasulallah. He said, Ya Rasulallah, Ma aslam tu min ajlil mal. I did not become Muslim to become wealthy. I did not become Muslim. I didn't con convert to Islam to make money. That's not what I converted to Islam for. Walakin aslam tu raghbatan fil Islam. I converted to Islam for Islam itself, for that submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa an akuna ma'ak. And so I could be with you. You know, he, he used to admire the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he was an ambassador for the non-Muslims. But it actually says that when he heard Ja'far speech in Abyssinia, when the Najashi, the, 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 uh, the Abyssinian king called the Muslims and said, okay, respond to this, in, uh, you know, to this demand to send you back. So Ja'far gave that wonderful speech. And Amr ibn Nas secretly says that Islam crept into my heart then, but it takes a while for it to express itself. He says, I wasn't really into the forefathers' religion. He was, was a politician. Politicians today, they don't really, many of them don't really care. They're just career politicians, many of them, right? Some of them are sincere. So, uh, sincere ones find it a bit difficult to ascend, they get knocked out. Um, it's a difficult one, it's not the game of sincere people, it looks like. So then he said, the Prophet said to him, a wonderful statement, and anybody who thinks that wealth is a bad thing, they should consider this hadith, these words. Because a lot of people think, okay, because generally wealth does cause people to do wrong things and makes them a bit arrogant, mischievous, overly secure um, with money, then you think that you can go and you know, do haram, it's easier for you to do haram. So people generally think money is the bad thing. It's not the money which is a bad thing, it's the heart of the person if it's not prepared for it. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said to him that don't think bad of money. He said, Ya Amr, ni'mal malu salih lil mar is salih. How wonderful and beautiful and pure is Halal wealth, righteous wealth for the righteous person. Now think about this. If righteous people, if you can have righteous halal wealth in the hands of righteous people, right, then you, we would have had a masjid here, a permanent building here already. Right? I'm not saying that there's not enough, we need more people like that. We would have not too many poor people in the world. Many of our projects would be done. Uh, the needy would be dealt with. This is the problem. You might have pure wealth, but it may not be in the hands of somebody who's completely righteous. They're righteous, they're praying salat, but they're not righteous in the sense of they don't have the compassion maybe. That's also part of righteousness. Bir. Bir is part of compassion, is part of bir. Right? Which means, you know, um, this concept of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the right way. So once that comes together, there's huge. And look at the people who had good amounts of wealth. Right? I mean, just a simple example of the wife of Harun and Rashid. Uh, her name was Zubaida. She did so many public welfare works with the money she had received. Right? Now, her father used to be the previous Khalif, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. So she must have got a good inheritance. She decided to spend it for the Muslims, especially in the Hajj area. She was in Baghdad. But in, she did so many public welfare works. And that's just a simple example. And there's so many people like this today as well.
with small amounts of money, but they got the righteous heart. So with that small amount of money, they're able to do a lot of good work. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. You know, may Allah give us tawfiq. I mean, I've seen this in South Africa. And I've seen this in India. I've seen this in Pakistan. I've seen this to some extent in America. England, alhamdulillah, we also have many, many people. Uh, there's, England is, a, mashallah, especially the Muslims, are a huge contributing uh, community. Huge contributions. But they're generally small contributions. Generally. Where when you go to South Africa, because they've been there maybe five, six generations. I know of uh, families who have businesses. And they've actually dedicated one business, fi sabilillah. All the profits from this particular business is going to be fi sabilillah. Um, in America, money is disposable. Money is easy to come. I've got a student who did hivs with me. And she's now becoming a doctor. She's going to be finishing next year training. And her starting salary for emergency medicine is going to be $400,000. And that's a crazy amount of money. In so many fundraisers in America have I seen where they're raising money, one guy, one businessman or major doctor or something, will say, everything that everybody collect, that is collected today, I'm going to double it. So I've hardly ever seen that in the UK, <laughs> right? Because I think the UK, the money is a bit more difficult, to, was more difficult to come by, but I think with this new generation, I think there are people with sitting with huge reserves. But it came difficult, so they're finding it. They can give the 20 man, they can give their zakat, yeah. right? And they can give a bit of extra money, but that is not there yet. That's how I feel. There are some families who've started work for endowments, but keep that in mind. Have that as an intention. And if you have that as an intention, Allah, allow me to do this in the future. Allah will give you the money to be able to do it. That's the way Allah will, inshallah, accept your dua. There's a guy that I know, he's got two daughters, no sons. He's got a really nice house he lives in, and he's owns two additional properties on rent. Must be, mashallah, making you know, a good amount of rent a year. So I visited one of the houses and I said, do you have a basement here? Because generally the house in that area have a basement. He said, no, just a small one. It's not done yet because you have to dig it up and make it proper. I said, why don't you do it? He said, oh, I've done enough already. I said, no. How much is it going to cost? I think he said between 50 to 70,000. I said, if you've got the money, spend it, do it. Then in a few years, you'll make your 50, 70. And then after that, you wanna, your intention is that this is all going to be fi sabirillah. It's there. Use it. Put the money in first. Recap your money if you want to. Recoup it if you want to. If not, make it fi sabirillah straight away. And you'll have barakah. If you have opportunities, you should put that. And you'll see that Allah will only increase the other world. Because these people that I know who give like this in the path of Allah, they don't become poor because of it. In fact, money pours in. Because Allah says that whoever gives... Who is going to give a loan? Because this is all loan to Allah. When we're giving to others for the sake of Allah, it's a loan to Allah because He's going to give it back. Allah says, we'll multiply it for you. Multiple, 700 times, 700,000 times, huge amounts that Allah will give you. But that, you need that tawfiq there in the beginning and that intention there. So what we learn from today is that business and mutual cooperation is part of human life. The Prophet ﷺ actually encouraged it. There's a good reward for good business people. But because business has this possibility of going wrong and haram business and wrongful business, so we need to avoid that to the best of our ability, have the right intentions of assisting one another as well, as well as making money and helping our own families. And may Allah then make that entire venture and the entire venture for even working for others, may Allah make that a rewarding act. وآخر الدعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام وتبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم يا معدن الجود والكرم يا أكرم الأكرمين يا خير المسؤولين ويا خير المؤتين ويا أرحم الراحمين ويا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا الله have your mercy upon us oh الله this is a month of your mercy this is a month of your generosity oh الله you have given so much abundance of reward and promise such an abundance of reward during this time. Oh Allah, we see the generosity that you have caused uh, to in, be engendered during this month. We see so many people donate. We see so many people feed others. We see so many people assist one another. Oh Allah, there's so much generosity that is happening right now during this month. Oh Allah, we then seek from you, from your generosity, that you have some mercy on on, on us, on, on, our, on us as sinners, 
on us as wrongdoers. Oh Allah, we have many shortcomings, many, many transgressions. Oh Allah, we have wasted so much of our life in pursuits which we could have benefited from. Oh Allah, we, uh, we ask that you grant us halal, we gr that you grant us halal income, you grant us from halal sources, that if we have any haram element to our wealth, that you allow us to weed it out as soon as possible to purify our wealth. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, allow us to suffice with purified wealth. Allow us to su be suffice with halal wealth so that we don't even feel like we need to go anywhere else. Oh Allah, allow us to help others and assist others. Oh Allah, enrich us, enrich our hearts. Oh Allah, enrich our hearts and our souls and our minds. And oh Allah, we ask that you protect us and especially our coming generations from the various different challenges which are out there. Oh Allah, this musalla which has been established by the people of this area. Oh Allah, take it from strength to strength. Oh Allah, increase it and enhance it and improve it. And make it a source of guidance, not just for this area, but for other areas. And oh Allah, protect it from all kinds of evils, protect it from all kinds of deviances, protect it from all kinds of jealousies and all other kinds of problems. And oh Allah, bless our forefathers who have allowed us to be Muslim today and our scholars who have assisted us in being Muslims today. And oh Allah, keep this Iman in our progeny until the Day of Judgment. Oh Allah, we ask that you send your abundant blessings on our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you grant us his company in the hereafter. Subhana Rabbika, Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifoon, Wa Salaamun Al Mursaleen, Walhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for listening. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, um, uh, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.